share today. And so, praise God. Thank you, Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Rob. <laughs> Aloy, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah. Feliz Dia de la Madre. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> today being Mother's Day, it's only appropriate that today's mes message focuses and puts the spotlight on mothers, but also on wives and daughters, because daughters become wives and wives become mothers. So happy Mother's Day, <coughs> Feliz Dia de la Madre, to daughters, wives, and mothers. I begin our message this morning with a confession. But not having a Catholic priest to confess to. <laughs> I will make a public confession and make a public humiliation of myself. As I know, I will put myself at risk of being ridiculed by my brothers here who happen, ladies, to be your husbands. <laughs> As I began working on this message, I had an epiphany. I was enlightened. You know, whereas epiphanies uh, connotate for the most part something positive, something good, something beneficial, something of use. This one was not. As I began putting my you know, thoughts together and started writing, well, I naturally thought about Darlene because she is my wife and she is a mother. Now, to make a long story short, you know what I came to realize? I realized that I really did not know my wife, even after all these years. I did not know her like I should. But that's not all of it. It gets worse. <laughs> because I have two daughters. And as I thought about not knowing my wife, I said, oh my goodness, what is going to happen to my daughters as they grow? Do they grow and grow away from me? As they get older, well, you know, you're supposed to grow together and you're supposed to know more about each other. But I was afraid as they get older, what, you know, am I going to get to that point where I don't know her too? Like I, you know, really don't know my wife. But it gets worse because after thinking about my wife and my daughters, I started thinking about my mother. I live with my mother. Well, I knew my mother for 57 years before she was called to that celestial city. And then it dawned on me, you know, if it happened to my wife and my daughters, wow, did I really know my mother? And so I came to a frightening conclusion that although I am a husband, a father, and a son, I still do not know and understand the opposite sex. <laughs> so, I was thinking, as I was writing this bench, and I call Steve because I know Steve, and he knows his wife, I mean, perfect, he knows everything about him, right? And then I started thinking about my brother Joe because, you know, he's married and he's got three daughters. And I was thinking, Joe, man, I should call Joe. You know, he knows a thing or two about women. You know, because he knows his daughters. And then, you know, I was thinking of calling, uh, you know, uh, Andy, Mr. Lon here, you know. Uh, maybe he knows a thing or two about women that he can teach me. And, I, and so all these other people at church, you know, all these other men and fathers came to my you know, should I call him, should I call him? Because, you know, they're experts, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so after struggling with this sobering, confusing epiphany of my imperfection and shortcoming in understanding the opposite sex, I decided that the best way to approach this message so that I too can learn from it would be to try and understand women strictly, strictly from God's perspective. In other words, how does God define a woman? 
And because it is, God, it is God's definition of a woman, then I believe we can refer to her as a godly woman, woman because this is a godly definition given by God, correct? <coughs> so that's what it is. Perspective on women from a godly perspective, God's perspective. Now, it is an impossible thing to honor mothers and to attribute to them their due respect given the allotted time. So I have selected five verses from Proverbs 31, a chapter that paints for us the traits, virtues, characteristics, qualities of a godly woman. It is my hope that within these five verses, God will help us to understand, to better understand, even if it is just a little, His definition of a godly woman, a godly, godly daughter, godly wife, a godly mother. You know, when I was, I was probably still in elementary, and I remember my mother uh, said, son, if you want to understand something about women, open to Proverbs 31. And he said, if you want to understand something about yourself, open to Proverbs 21 and read that. And so every time I open up to Proverbs 21 or Proverbs 31, I think about my mother. Our text is from Proverbs 31, chapter, uh, verses 29, uh, 25 to 29. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also praises her, saying, Many daughters have done excellently, but you used to pass them on. Strength and dignity. When we hear the word strength, or when I hear the word strength, the first thing that comes to mind is physical strength. We picture in our minds some guy with muscles bulging all over, lifting a million pounds of weight, but never a woman. So then how are women strong? What is meant by strength when referring to a woman? Guys, okay, I want you to think about this. I want you to honestly think about this. What if, you'll have a laugh, ladies. What if all men had to feel and experience the pain that women feel and experience when they go into labor? <laughs> What if all men had to feel and experience the physical pain when they are giving birth to your sons and daughters? Huh? Two things come to mind. First, I believe all men would be in awe of the strength, of the courage, of the grit, of the toughness of our wives. Amen. Amen. And therefore, we would come to show them so, so, so much respect. Say amen, ladies. Amen. <laughs> I'm trying to be on your side. <laughs> Secondly, more men would be coming to church. More men would be coming to church because there would be no NFL. As men would come to see, as men would come to see that women are in fact the stronger sex, so they would just do away with football. And so men would have to go and find something like Maybe badminton? <laughs> Women have an inner strength. It's not the kind of strength you go showing off or flaunting around 
like guys do after they come out of the gym. Most guys like to build themselves up physically. They want the people, they want people to see that they're strong, macho. But that is not how the strength of a godly woman is revealed. The strength of a godly woman is an inward strength. After all, didn't God say to Samuel, Samuel, do not look at the appearance. Amen. Do not look at the appearance, the outward appearance. So guys, I hate to deflate your ego. I hate to burst your bubble. But God is not interested in your muscles. He's not interested in your muscles, guys. But he is very interested in looking into your heart. In John 4, Jesus sets out on a must journey. He had an appointment with a Samaritan woman, a woman of ill repute. She's a prostitute. Can you imagine traveling? Someone asking me, wait, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to go see a prostitute. Jesus is on his way to see a woman of ill repute. At this point in her life, in this American woman's life, she had already had five husbands. And she was living with someone that was not her husband. Now, you know, people, uh, believers included, us, yeah, uh, we would uh, likely distance ourselves from someone like this. Many would most likely condemn her and thereby not allowing her an opportunity to better her lot in life, but not Jesus. <clears throat> after her encounter with Jesus at the well, being witnessed to and being offered living water, not only did she find a new lease on life, but a new found purpose that strengthened her. It empowered her to do the unexpected, to do things she never thought was possible. Her newfound strength gave her courage and boldness to step out in faith against great odds and allowed her to persevere the mocking of people because of the life she once lived. This newfound strength led her to become one of the great evangelists of the New Testament. A woman being married five times and now living with someone, it doesn't say whether or not she has children or whether she was a mother. But, you know, just guessing here, she was probably a mother. And after five husbands, she probably had children and was a single mother. So this lady had a lot going against her. She was a woman. She was a Samaritan. She was a prostitute. She was a single mother. But after her encounter with Jesus, she was strengthened by the encounter. Can you imagine her trying to witness to someone from her own time? A prostitute witnessing to someone about ethical living, about moral conduct, that alone, alone telling them that the Messiah is here and that he spoke to her. People must have laughed in her face. You, a prostitute, and you want to preach to me about living a righteous life? Oh, the strength, the courage, the toughness, the backbone, the resolve displayed here by this woman. She would not be deterred. She would not be defeated. She would not be denied. She would not be shamed or talked down to. She was now the daughter of the living king. She endured the stinging rebukes, rose above the harsh, hurtful, and demeaning personal attacks. The strength of this once ill-reputed Samaritan woman is that godly character that identifies her as a godly woman, a woman of God. Dignity. Dignity is defined as 
a bearing conduct or speech indicative of self-respect. It speaks to the nobility of character and worthiness. A godly woman is a dignified woman, one who carries herself gracefully, elegantly, with self-respect. She has to. She is the daughter and ambassador of the Most High God. <coughs> no pride or self-righteousness is found in her. She is so, so, so much above that. To do any less would be to live below the standards she has set as her code of ethics and conduct. When she walks into a gathering, she has no need to be announced. Her name and her character precedes her. She has set her standards, each one distinguished with God's stamp of dignity. She smiles at the future. The question is, what is this woman smiling at as she looks to the future? What is so good about the future to smile at? Smile at. I mean, let's face it, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the future of the world of this morning is not a very bright one. You know, this week there was an Ebola outbreak in Africa. Did you know that? Yes. There was an Ebola outbreak in Africa. This week, in Australia, the worst mass murder in over 20 years. This week, Iran attacked Israel from its outpost in Syria. And so Iran naturally retaliated yeah, and cleaned house in Israel, which led, of course, to the uprising of the Palestinians which of course is going to, you know, Israel's not going to sit back. Amen. So we see escalation in the Middle East. I mean, we don't even have to go beyond our borders. Look at what's happening in our political world. There are two party system here going against each other. Uh, they're not attacking policies. No, they're going after the juggler. They want to take this president down. They want to take people down. They get, it's, it's, it's become personal. They're not looking after the betterment of the people. No. They're going after the kill. So what is there to smile at? What is she smiling at the future? What does she know that we don't know? Make no mistake about this. The future mom is smiling at is not the future of the world. It is her future. She smiles at the future, at her future, because while living on earth, she was storing and investing for herself treasures in heaven. You see, I believe godly mothers understand better than anyone about investing. Even business people. Say, what? That's impossible. How? Well, it's not by subscribing to the Wall Street Journal or being updated every hour by uh, NASDAQ or the Dow Jones Industrial or by the S&P 500. She just takes her morning journal, morning economic journal, and reads it in the morning. It counsels her as to what to invest in. She turns to one of her investment advisors from the Jesus Life Unlimited Financial Company <laughs> and turns to one of the advisors there and his name is Matthew. And Matthew tells her, oh, hey mom, listen. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. So the next day, mom gets up in the morning, oh, my economic journey. She continues reading. And now she comes across and speaks to 
another one of the advisors from the Jesus Life Unlimited uh, financial company. And his name is Timothy. Good morning, Ma. Ma. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the certainty, the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasures of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Someone say amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, this Mali Mama here had her sights on celestial things. She was amassing treasures in heaven while living here on earth. She was investing in things not of this world. It is no wonder we are told in chapter 31, verse 10, that her net worth is much, much more than any jewel or treasure. The returns on this mother's investment are far beyond our wildest dreams, our wildest imaginations, our wildest hallucinations. She smiles at the future because although she cannot visually see into the future, her faith, the assurance of things so forth, the evidence of things not seen, she knows will be justified in the future. She smiles, she smiles at the future because she is assured of the future. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. She smiles at the future because she knows that according to God's word, scripture after scripture, promise after promise, that she, when she passes on from this life, she is assured that she will be in eternity, in eternity with her Lord and Savior. She smiles at the future because she has spoken seeds of life to her children. She has watered and nourished them with the Word of God. Her faith has taught her that these seeds will one day blossom and bear fruits of the seed whence it came from. Some of these seeds have already blossomed. And they have produced fruits. Oh, do godly women ever love to smile at the future? Her future. Her family's future. She opens her mouth and wins. The book, the book of Proverbs, in chapter 1 tells us that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. Not that we should be afraid or coward from God, but to honor Him by living a life that is a complete submission to His perfect will. To highlight the wisdom of a godly woman, I want to share with you a small part <coughs> of the life of my mother. My mother, she was a wise woman because she feared God. She honored God, she respected God, she revered God. She had no fancy schooling, no college, yet she is the wisest woman I have ever known. You see this book? This is what she read and this is what she spent her time on studying. This book is not only the Word of God. It is a book on history. It is a book of science. It is a book of literature. It is a book of poetry. It is a math book. It is a book on psychology. It is a book on strategy and warfare. It is a book on ethics, morals, values, life lessons. It is a book on prophecy, on future things to come. And to her, it was a love letter. It was a love letter from Jesus to her. And within it, she told us that it contained the answer to all of life's problems, the answers to all the problems of the world, if we would only take our time to read it. She had no fancy degree or education. 
but she read and she studied this book. She gleaned and gathered its truth, promises, and blessings. We heard it when she spoke. We heard it when she counseled us. We heard it when she prayed. And boy, did she have command of the information of this book. If my mom went on a Bible Jeopardy show, she would be a billionaire. Her only setback would be her limited English. She would probably be the first contestant to answer all questions in every category <coughs> in both rounds. I would hate to be the contestant on the show with her because I would definitely be put to shame. If there was a Tokelau or Samoan Bible trivia board game, we would all want to be on her team. That way, we could all pretend like we're doing something for our team, while in reality, Mom was doing all the thinking and all the work. Yes, and we would win. The contents of this book, she applied to her life. That is wisdom. This morning, as we honor our mothers, I can only imagine, as we spoke on Mother's Day, I can only imagine what she would say to me. But she wouldn't speak directly to me, just me alone, because she would always want to know what's going on with my wife and my children. So I can hear her speaking to me and Darlene and the kids, words of wisdom. And she would probably say, Son, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk to them about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hand and bind them to your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. She knows how to open her mouth in wisdom. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. The Bible teaches us that kindness is a fruit of the Spirit, as noted by Paul in Galatians. The bearing of this fruit in one's life is directly related to the carrying of the tree that bears it. Its physical appearance, its health, its sweetness, is a result of the soil in which it was planted, and whether also it was watered regularly, fed nutrients, pruned when needed, and was it protected from the elements, from diseases, and from insects. And if the tree is cared for in this way, the grower can then expect a healthy, fruit-bearing tree. Fathers, this is an area in our daughter's lives where we are really needed. If we want our daughters to grow up to be this tree, producing spiritual fruits, then we need to care for them and be attentive towards them because our daughters will one day be wives and then one day become mothers. We, fathers, along with our wives, must be part of the soil that her roots grow in. We need to make sure she is watered, that she is nourished, fed, yes, even pruned when needed, according to the Word of God. As fathers, we have the responsibility, duty, to protect them from the elements of the world. We need to be there to counsel them, to instruct them, to lead by words and conduct, and to show her, to show her how a woman is to be treated by a man, how a wife is to be treated by a husband, how a mother is to be treated by a father. In order, Father, Father, in order for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control 
to be birthed in the lives of our daughters. We must invest in them. It will require work. It will require our time. It will require a lot of our effort. And remember, our daughters will one day become wives and one day become mothers. Let us fathers, let us raise, raise our daughters so that they can produce all, all fruits of the Spirit in their lives. She looks well to the ways of her household. In college, I lived with guys who were just terrible. I mean, they didn't do laundry for months. I mean, I can tell you a story. You know, I, I, I was in state, San Diego State, and we're down, if you're familiar with the campus, we're sitting down by the library. We're looking up towards Monty's dance, and one of the guys said, hey, Debbie, that looks like you up there. I said, what? And I looked up. My roommate, who didn't do his laundry for months, went into my closet and was wearing my clothes. Now, my clothes are, uh, you can tell because, you know, aloha shirt and, you know, shorts and... What? I mean, some guys don't do laundry for months. And then I know guys who just pile the dishes up in the sink for days. But I've never known a woman who was happy in a messy home. The mothers I know, they see to it that their houses are clean, tidy, that it smells good and livable. Now, just to be fair, just to be fair to the guys, okay, I know two guys, two guys who really care about keeping things neat. Two guys who care about being tidy and organized. Thank you, And one of them, and one of them, is Felix Umber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you don't know who Felix Umber is, you can ask someone. <laughs> but most guys are like Oscar Madison. <laughs> yeah, you're wondering who the other person is, right? Yours truly. Yeah. Mothers want a clean, livable home. I'm sorry, gang. You know this weather change here? It just gets to me. Mothers want a clean, livable home because it is their castle. It is their domain. It is their realm. It is there that they rule supreme. It is there that they're the queen mother. And I was writing this. The thought that came to mind was my sweet sister Tess. You know, I... I, I got to know her uh, as we did the Sunday uh, potluck. And uh, she, she was really a worker. Yeah, I, I, I try to do this and I'll get that thing. No, 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 no. <laughs> and then she'll do something and say, Tess, step aside. You know, Carla and Mariana is here. You know, they can do that. Ah, no, no, no. Carla, go get your coffee across the street. She'll say, uh, you know, Denny, I'm going across the street. You know, I can get it for you. But you are not going to get anything from me, Tess. Carlos is going to go to Mariana. No, I'll get it. When we ended, uh, you know, at the end of the day here for Papa, she would be, you know, cleaning up the place. And, and then we bring everything over here. And, uh, you know, there are other ladies here that, that, you know, work as well. You know, Carol is always here too, helping out uh, with, uh, with the cleaning and stuff. But she made sure that, you know, when we brought things into the kitchen, the pots and pans, Joanne as well, you know, that everything is cleaned and put away and scrubbed and... You know, you can tell, right, because uh, when I go to Mark and Tessa's home, it's really spick and span and clean. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... She's probably up there polishing it, <laughs> and cleaning marks. She's polishing the gold and the diamonds and all the precious metals and jewels. And she's doing that because she's waiting for us to uh, come and join us. But mothers are also protectors of their homes. 
In our home, our daughters understand that at any, any given time, their mother can go into their backpacks, phones, into their rooms, and check them. Because mom wants and needs to know what's coming into her realm and what is going out. And if there's anything uh, attempted to make its way in and bringing with it harm or danger to the citizens of her realm, she will find a way to put a stop to it. And if need be, she will put an end to it. In Judges chapters 4 and 5, we read of a woman who can show us a thing or two about how to deal with the unwanted when it comes to your Lord. Now I won't go into the details of context of the story, but uh, you know, just briefly, Israel is fighting a war against the Canaanites. The Canaanite army is routed, and their general, Sisera, flees the onslaught and makes his way to the doorsteps of a woman named Joel, a housewife. I mean, Jael, Jael, a housewife. You know, danger and sin, they somehow find a way to your doorstep and stealthily, slyly make their way in. Jael left Cicero, but most likely out of fear as she was home alone by herself. She knew who this man was, but she was helpless to do anything. So she concocts her plan. <coughs> Cicero enters into her home. He goes and he lays down and makes himself at home. After making himself at home, he asks for a drink. Then he tells her, go stand guard at the door, and then orders her that if anyone comes looking for him, lie to me and tell them that I am not here. But isn't this how sin operates? It comes to your doorstep, and the minute you let it in, it begins taking control of your life and dictates your life. It tells you what to do. It orders you around. even forces you to tell lies. But Jael is a smart one. She has half the plan to do away with this danger that has entered into her home. So as Cicero makes himself at home, sleeping in jo Jael's tent, while her husband is awake, she takes a tent peg and she takes a hammer and she walks over, put it right on his temple and bam! Glory! She kills the enemy general. Now, you can look at this two ways. One, oh, she was a murderer! How could she commit such a violent act, so gruesome? He is an evil. Or you can look at it this way. The threat and danger to my family is no more. I prefer the latter. No threat to my family. That my wife and my children are safe. Jael, indeed, looked well to the ways of her household. In chapter 5, the next chapter, uh, there's a song written in honor of Deborah, a judge of Israel. But in that song is a portion that honors Jael for putting to death the leader of the enemy. Her children rise up to bless her. My mother loved her husband. She loved her children. She loved her family. She prayed over them daily, praying for each by name. And I know that because, you know, when I pray with her, like, oh. I, you can ask Darlene. You know, so, ooh, three hours later? <laughs> I, I, I kid you not. But she, she prays, uh, you know, she goes through all their children. You know, so, mention them by name. Without a doubt, make no mistake, her prayer life has laid the foundation for the lives that we as her children live today. It has directly impacted the paths and lives that we as her children have traveled. We as her children cannot fathom the impact of her life upon all of us. Her words, her teaching, 
humility, kindness, soft-spoken, her love. Priceless. The seeds she started planting some 66 years ago have taken roots, given life to new plants that have grown and flourished to a beautiful flower garden of blessings. We, her children, we stood in line to bless her. Whatever resources and fruits of the labors of our hands, we offered to her as a blessing. When my mother was in need of a carpet, someone would rush there and say, no, I got it. When she needed appliances in the house, someone would rush there and say, oh, no, I got it. When she needed to fly to Samoa, go to Tokelau, fly to New Zealand, people would, you know, we would say, oh, no, no, I got it. I'm paying her fair. When she would come out here, same thing, oh, no, I got it. After church, on, on Sundays, oh, I'm taking my mom to dinner. What? Oh, I thought I was taking her. No, I'm taking her out to dinner. During the week, mom, what are you doing? Oh, let's go have some shea bites. Take her down to the beach. She was never lacking. She was never wanting because her children always rose to bless her. Let me ask everyone here in the sanctuary this morning. How many of you are planning to prepare lunch or dinner for your wife uh, or mother or taking her out for lunch or dinner? Yeah? Well, there you go. Right? Evidence. You're blessing your mothers, your wives, and your daughters. Her children rise up to bless her. Many women, and I conclude with this, many women have done excellently, but you, you surpass them all. When Darlene and I got married, she was the breadwinner in our family. Even when I began teaching, she was the breadwinner. And those times when I was between jobs or going to school and not working, she continued to work and even excelled at what she did. Today, she continues to be the source of our finances. It is through her tireless work attitude and love for family that has kept us above water. I'm not ashamed to say that. It's the truth. Because that is the kind of woman that she is. But beyond all of that, and mostly, most important, she is the woman that I fell in love with. So much so that I asked her to marry me and be my wife. She took a vow to love me, to care for me till death do us part. And up till today, and I know she will forever be, be been faithful and true in upholding her vows. And as a husband, I would like to say to her what God has said about the, that woman in your life that matters the most to you. And so I say here to her, Hon, many women have done excellent, but you have surpassed them all. Husbands, fathers, men, may I suggest to you that before the day is over, as you go out to have lunch or to have dinner or to celebrate this day with your wives, your daughters, your mother, <clears throat> turn to them and say to them, because they are, they are the most important women in your life. Say to them, honey, many women have done excellent, but you, you surpassed them all. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done excellent things, but you, you surpass them all. Happy Mother's Day. Feliz 
dia de la madre, para mí te amo más tú. God bless all of you. Before everybody goes, worship team can come up. Come on up. Uh, you guys have no idea what a blessing it is for me uh, to have some of the guys in this church preach while while I'm gone, whether it's in Africa or Mexico. And uh, sometimes I get the pleasure of coming back and being here on a Sunday so that I can hear them. And uh, I praise God that he has lifted up some teachers in this church that bless me. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Wow. Amen. And uh, moms, you really are important. Uh, I'd just like to uh, close out with a prayer. And, and uh, moms, could you do me a favor? Could you just stand up if you're a mother today? We want to honor you. We, we are so thankful for you. My mom passed away about six or seven years ago, but I can tell you uh, she made me the, the person I am because she believed in me even when I was a mess. And so many times, you mothers, that's what you do best, is uh, you raise your kids up. But uh, let's, uh, let's pray for the moms now. Father, we, we thank you for the women in our lives that bless us so much. And we pray that a double portion of your spirit would fall on the mothers here. And I want to pray a special prayer for the single moms here today, Lord. Who I appreciate so much too, Lord. They, they go out and work for a living, Lord. They come home and make dinner and do homework with the kids and get up and do it again, Father. We love our wives. We love our moms, Lord. And today we pray that you would give them a double portion of of blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's all stand and close by worshiping.